Thank you very much, respected chairpersons, seniors, colleagues, dear friends. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Anuj Maheshwari for giving me this opportunity. And I'm privileged to be a part of the team ACP and to be privileged to be present here on uh, giving a talk in front of this august audience. So I'll be speaking on exogenous hyper and hypothyroidism. So basically when we say exogenous hypo and hyperthyroidism, uh, in that one part is iatrogenic hypothyroidism as well. Uh, if we talk about a permanent damage, usually it's a surgical issue or a drug which has lead to a permanent damage, then that becomes a permanent sequel. Sometimes there might be a reversible damage to the thyroid which usually leads to a, a transient uh, problem. Surgical hypothyroidism, if there is a total uh, removal of the thyroid gland, it has to be replaced. Replacement therapy is mandatory. However, if there is a partial hypothyroidism or subtotal thyroidectomy, then a smaller dose may be required. We have to be careful in pregnancy and in women of reproductive age group, they need to have a TSH less than 2.5. So treatment in a case of post-operative hypothyroidism, even if it is subclinical, should written not be discouraged. It should be given. So when we talk about the thyroid axis, the uh, 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 hypothalamus pituitary thyroid axis, this is prone to interactions with a wide variety of drugs and hypothyroid is the most frequent consequence of these. Thionamides, the drugs causing hypothyroidism, thionamides as we know very well, it's used in treatment of hyperthyroidism, it inhibits the thyroperoxidase and inhibits the oxidation, the organification of the iodide, the coupling process. So if our synthesis of uh, thyroid hormone is reduced, this we know very well, this is in the treatment of hyperthyroidism, however it's very common to get hypothyroidism if it's given a dose more on, in, a pro, in, in a fashion which is not correct, it may lead to hypothyroidism. Going to other agents, now which are more important and which we probably don't realize, one of them is iodine. If you see, iodine is one of the most important constituent as we know of the thyroid hormone. The iodine was discovered in 1811 by Bernard Coteus. Its name comes from the Greek word iodos, which means violet. Now what happens when this iodine, which is so much required for the thyroid hormone, suppose it is in excess, then what happens? If it's in excess, then there it inhibits. There's a decrease in the iodide transport and there's a decrease in the iodide oxidation organification. It may also lead to immunostimulation. It has been shown that an excessive iodine intake increases the risk of hypothyroidism as well as thyroid autoimmunity. So here is where what we talk about the wolf checkoff effect. So what is the wolf checkoff effect? So it's, presu it's, it's uh, a presumed reduction in the thyroid hormone levels which is caused by an ingestion of a very large amount of iodine. So suppose our thyroid gland is exposed to excess of iodine, what happens instead of forming the thyroid hormone, the, all these steps are begun to be uh, hindered and inhibited. This was first discovered by Dr. Jan uh, Wolf and Dr. Lyon Chekhov. And why it happens so? Why does this Wolf Chekhov effect occur? Because the thyroid self itself has several self-regulatory functions. So it it's sort of a protective mechanism. Whenever there is a sudden increase in thyroid uh, iodide serum levels, then as a protective mechanism, the synthesis gets inhibited and the, there's a decrease in uh, oxidation as well as synthesis as well as release. So what happens? Hypothyroidism results, but then when a person is normal, when has, one has a normal functioning thyroid, then within a period of two weeks, the thyroid gland uh, undergoes an escape from this inhibition which is going on. So an, uh, 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 an, an escape phenomena occurs in a normal person and again there is a, the, the thyroid synthesis again begins in a normal fashion as was before the exposure to iodide. But in a case where there is a lower thyroid reserve, the autoimmune thyroiditis, goiters, in these conditions, they do not have this escape phenomenon so well, which is impaired, and that leads to hypothyroidism. So this wolf checkoff effect is used in the principle in treatment of hyperthyroidism by iodide, and it also uh, explains uh, so many uh, iodine-containing drugs, which we will be talking about later on. 
The predisposing factors for iodine-induced hypothyroidism are autoimmune thyroiditis. So if one has any of these, then one is more susceptible to have iodine-induced hypothyroidism. Autoimmune thyroiditis, post-treatment of hyperthyroidism, previous hemithyroidectomy for a nodular goiter, past history of postpartum thyroiditis, subacute thyroiditis, drug-induced thyroiditis, thalassemia major, because there the patients do have some hemosideresis occurring, even in CKD patients and extremes of age group. So where do we get so much frequently exposed? So in, in acute exposures, especially by radio contrast, contrast agents which contain iodine and CT scan uh, uh, with a contrast agent, or we can have systemic exposure to iodine or a tropical exposure. In all these conditions, there will be a decrease in TSH, there will be uh, increase in TSH, decrease in thyroid hormones, increase in the urinary excretion. Talking about imaging studies, see this is more common than what we give it due uh, 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 importance because it has been seen that all these angiography, venography, pilography, ERCP, myelography, CT and so many they use iodine contrast and because of this a, a large number of patients as high as 20% may develop thyroid dysfunction, hypo or hyperthyroidism secondary to the iodine contrast. Uh, coming ahead of that, now the next important drug when we talk about iodine excess is amiodaron. Amiodaron is a benzofuron derivative with a high iodine content. About 39% of its molecular weight is iodine. 39% of molecular weight of amiodaron is uh, 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 iodine and that is why when we take it in a therapeutic dose of 200 to 600 milligrams per day, we are taking about 50 to 100 times higher intake of iodine than what a, a person who is not taking amiodaron would take. So this then, and it has a long half-life. Elimination half-life is 100 days. So it gets deposited everywhere in the adipose tissue, in the liver, connective tissue, in the thyroid gland, in the muscles, heart muscles. What it does, it causes a decrease in the iodide transport, reduction in synthesis of thyroid hormones by the wolf jeffcock effect that we just discussed, blockade of release of hormone, and then it also may cause thyroid tox cytotoxicity sometimes, some, that may lead to sometimes Hyperthyroidism, I'll be discussing that later on. So talking about amiodarone-induced hypothyroidism, it usually appears in the first 6 to 18 months of treatment. It's common in women, in elderly patient, and those who have a pre-existing autoimmunity, usually in areas of sufficient iodine intake. If it is, uh, if the uh, amiodarone-induced hypothyroidism is sustained or severe, we may have even ventricular arrhythmias. So basically being used for arrhythmias may further lead to arrhythmias because of this complication that may develop. Sometimes even renal disorders are seen, which are usually reversible, thankfully. So what should we do in a patient who develops hypothyroidism following prolonged amiodarone use? If previous thyroid dysfunction is there, then uh, even after the discontinuation of amiodarone, the, uh, the dysfunction is going to persist. He will require chronic levothyroxine therapy. But my, it is important to note that it is not necessary to interrupt the amiodarone administration if hypothyroidism occurs. That we have to remember. Because usually we can correct the hypothyroidism and that suffices. How do we decide on this? It depends on the degree of thyroid dysfunction, depends on the cardiac status, the patient's age. All these factors are important in deciding whether we have to continue amiodarone and re replace the thyroxine, which however is required. For starting a thyroxine in this, we start with a small dose usually, titrate, up titrate every four to six weeks because the patient usually has a cardiac disorder. And according to the tolerance and the cardiac status, we uh, reach up to the required level. So it's important to note that before we, we should monitor thyroid profile in all patients receiving amiodarone. That is the underline that we should remember before beginning, at the end of first month, at the end of third month, and then six months thereafter, six monthly thereafter. Then we come to lithium. Lithium carbonate is an alkali cation used in neuropsychiatry to treat bipolar disorders. Say one in 200 patients of bipolar disorders will be given lithium as a treatment. And the lithium gets concentrated in the thyroid around three to four times more than it is in the blood. So it also causes hypothyroidism and blocks the release of the hormone, inhibiting the iodotyrosine coupling. 
lithium has a specific characteristic that it even promotes some of the uh, uh, factors which are uh, uh, the growth factors in the thyroid and leads to goiter formation. So it's, it's supposed to be goitrogenic as well and hypothyroidism also occurs. Lithium occurs uh, uh, more in women in the first two years and again withdrawal may not be always required. You may correct the thyroid levels but again the underlying statement that we should monitor and watch for the disorder. Then we have minocycline. Minocycline is an antibiotic in the tetracycline group used to treat acne vulgaris. And it's very interesting to note that way back in 1967, first time minocycline induced black thyroid was described by Bennett et al. Till date, about 125 cases are reported in literature. And even other uh, and, uh, tetracycline group like doxycycline may also induce this black uh, pigmentation which occurs because of the oxidation by the thyroid peroxidase and this pigmentation can be seen in the skin, in the sclera, in the bone, in the teeth, gingiva and the nails. So this also inhibits the thyroid function and this also causes hypothyroidism. Drug induced thyroiditis. So in, in addition to what we just talked of, we talked of the uh, 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 wolf checkoff effect, we talked about the action of these drugs. Now, the drugs directly causing thyroiditis. In that, we have some important groups of drugs, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which are now very much used these days, the interferons, alpha, beta, interleukins, etanercept, used for so many connective tissue disorders and uh, so many other neoplastic uh, conditions as well. Some monoclonal antibodies, lenardinolamide, anti-TNF-alpha, infeximab, which is so commonly used, and then the ischemic thyrokinase inhibitors, the, which block the vascular endothelial growth factor. These all are important as they cause thyroiditis. So interferon al uh, alpha, which is a, a very important drug used very often, how does it cause? It is, so what is found is, is the mechanism is still not very clear. Way back in 1986, I think that is a time when we began to use the interferons. Since then, thyroid dysfunction in, has been reported. It is used, where do we use it? In leukemia, condyloma, acuminatum, Kaposi's sarcoma, hepatitis B and C. So what is stated is that probably there is a recruitment of some immune cells, probably the natural killer cells which damage the thyroid or probably they, the drug directly has a cytotoxic effect. Thyroiditis is seen in 20 to 40 percent and it is more seen in patients with thyroid autoimmunity. It's interesting to note that patients with hepatitis C where we use interferon alpha very often they have more or they are more prone to this hypothyroidism because it's said that the hepatitis C and the uh, uh, thyroid antigens, they seem to have some th molecular mimicry with a similar appearance and they, that causes more of autoimmunity and then this, uh, thyroiditis and then uh, hypothyroidism. Now having said that, there are other mechanisms by which we can have hypothyroidism and these are acting at the level of the pituitary. So secondary or central drug-induced hypothyroidism occurs more often than what we give credit to. There's a drug called P beta uh, uh, bexarotene. A bexarotene is a retinoid. Uh, it's a new group of retinoid used in the treatment of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. And it has been found to induce central hypothyroidism in a large number of patients. So this is what we have to remember, that central hypothyroidism can also occur with these newer drugs. Somatostatin analogs, which are used in many conditions like acromegaly, in carcinoid syndrome, in VIP tumors, they can also induce central hypothyroidism. Glucocorticoids. Glucocorticoids have a very important relationship with uh, uh, thyroid hormones. At physiological level, hydrocortisone plays an important role in the diurnal variation of TSH. It's found that it, TSH is lower in the morning and higher in the night, secondary to the impact of the glucocorticoids. So in patients who have adrenal insufficiency, we usually will find a high TSH level. It's not uncommon to find that. And in patients who are on high doses of glucocorticoids, in such patients we find that TSH is suppressed in normal as well as hypothyroid individuals. So this is something that we have to keep in mind since it's a drug which we use very often. Then we have dopamine and its agonists such as bromocriptine. They again, they also suppress the TSH uh, secretion by activating the T2 receptors. Now some immune mechanisms. When we talk about the immune mechanisms, there is an anti-cytotoxic T lymphocyte associated anti-CTLA antibodies. 
uh, which uh, uh, like of the group ipilimumab and trimilumab which induce acute lymphocytic hypophysitis and this leads to a condition of pan hypopituitarism and central hypothyroidism is one of the commonest features that we seen in this lymphocytic hypophysitis so since these are the newer drugs which are coming up they have seem to have quite a significant impact on thyroid as well as the endocrine system and have to be kept a watch of now interactions in the treatment of hypothyroidism now having seen the drugs which af uh, have affected now that we have a patient of hypothyroidism what are the various things which can interact in the treatment and lead to a result which is probably not that good and sometimes we may be thinking as to why we didn't get the result good enough that tsh separation why it is not good enough probably we have to keep in mind so many interactions when we talk about the levothyroxine which is uh, given to uh, a person of hypothyroidism approximately 62 to 82 of the orally administered levothyroxine is absorbed within the first 3 hours after intake mainly from the jejunum and ileum and the absorption is higher on an empty stomach so there are various agents which can alter the intestinal obstruction and there's a huge group the lipid lowering drugs the sucralfate aluminum hydroxide ppis that we were discussing in the previous session iron salts calcium carbonate laxatives antacids containing magnesium sodium sulfur uh, polystyrene then the phosphate binders zevalimer and lal uh, lanthanum carbonate chromium raloxifene all is that tyrosine kinase inhibitors so there's a huge list and it's preferable to see that these drugs are at a given if at they need to be given at a time which is separated from the thyroxine uh, administration by at least 3 to 4 hours not only drugs there are dietary substances also which interact with the thyroid commonly being bran being significantly inhibiting the intestinal obstruction of levothyroxine soy containing nutritional preparations soy being used very often it has been seen that but it affects the intestinal obstruction so we have to keep it separate from the thyroid uh, formulation that we are giving prunes which we call alu bukhara that also can cause espresso coffee also in herbal remedies so to avoid these ad interactions it's better that administration of these uh, drugs and food kept separate by around 4 to 6 hours vitamin c may increase the absorption of levothyroxine now just a line of the drugs which alter the liver thyroxine transport and metabolism as we know that the main transporter is the thyroid uh, thyroxine binding globulin and we also know that there is an impact of estrogens on the metabolism of thyroxine binding uh, globulin in the form that it gets glycosylated and estrogens also increase the hepatic synthesis of the tbg so the clearance is delayed because more of the hormone is in the bound form so we have a total t4 and t3 may be higher and in a patient who is receiving the uh, estrogen therapy uh, uh, postmenopausal woman for example receiving estrogen therapy or a young woman on oc pills she may uh, oral contraceptive pills she may require a little higher dose of replacement to have an adequate thyroid function so evaluation and monitoring at 6 to 8 weeks of starting of these agents should be is recommended then we have the cypochrome uh, with uh, 3a4 enzyme inducers the drugs for enzyme induction carbazepine rifampicin phenytoin but it is to be noted that in a person with a normal thyroid function uh, these uh, in a healthy individual the hypothalamic pituitary axis thyroid axis compensates for all the this change which occurs however in a person who has a somewhat reduced reserve again will develop hypothyroidism and may re the replacement uh, doses for the levothyroxine will increase now a word about exogenous hyperthyroidism when i go to exogenous hyperthyroidism we should know what is the jord based row effect which is also called the jord based row phenomenon this is exactly the opposite of what we were discussing in the wolf chekhov effect it is hyperthyroidism following the administration of iodine or iodide either as a dietary supplement iodinated contrast uh, um, uh, imaging uh, substance or as a medication typically this occurs in patients who are having iodine deficiency who are the residents of iodine deficiency areas and when they relocate to iodine abundant geographical area typically in them it may be observed it is to be noted that the hyperthyroidism develops within 2 to 4 weeks following the iodine administration 
But what is important to note is that it does not occur in patients with normal thyroid glands. Why? Because in them, it is under the, th the thyroid gland is under the P uh, HPA axis uh, regulation and there it does not allow this uh, hyperthyroidism to work out. But in the patients who is in iodine deficiency zone, there they begin trapping more of iodine and they develop, they pro pro uh, produce more of hormone and lead to hyperthyroidism. Similarly, we have, uh, when we talk about thyrotoxicosis, amiodarone, which we talked about, ami amiodarone induced thyrotoxicosis. Here we have type 1 amiodarone induced thy thyrotoxicosis. Yes, just one. Just one more slide. Related to excess iodine release from Timing the drug. Timing out. Yeah, so this is the last only. We have type 1 and type 2. And the, the monoclonal antibody I already discussed. So I would conclude that several drugs affecting the thyroid hormone status, thyroid function should be previously assessed and regularly monitored. Intake of levothyroxine should be separated from the drugs which and the foods which impair its absorption. And the newer immunomodulating antineoplastic therapies, they have an interaction that has to be kept in mind. Thank you so much for your